Welcome to the show. I'm Jordan Harbinger. Anxiety is a scourge that many of us face, whether we're regular nine to fivers, parents, entrepreneurs, or even celebrity talk show hosts. And no, I'm not talking about myself. One of my favorite people to talk to is my friend, Charlemagne the God, one of the most popular FM radio hosts in the world. I know a lot about Charlemagne, from his storied career to his legions of fans numbering in the millions to his best-selling books. But what I did not know is that anxiety has been plaguing him for years, and it's dramatically affected his life. Today's discussion centers around an inside look at the life of someone in the public eye, the external pressures we all face and have in common, and of course, what we can do to manage them. If you want to know how I get some of these amazing guests, I'm teaching you networking and relationship development for free over at 6-Minute Networking. That's at jordanharbinger.com slash course. In the meantime, enjoy this episode with Charlemagne the God. Do you have to be careful of what you say when you're on in other countries? Or does it, it doesn't matter, right? They just censor out whatever they need nah, to. I don't even, I, that, to be honest with you, man, I don't even care no more. Like, it was like a year of, uh, a year of like, oh, I gotta walk on eggshells and this mm-hmm. and that. And it's like, man, I can't work like that. Yeah. Like, people are gonna get mad anyway. So it's just like, for me, it's just like, nowadays, it don't even matter what you said today. They pulling up shit that you said 10 years ago. I know. I, wonder, <laughs> I wondered about that. Because, like, this new book, uh, Shook One, is about anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, how can you not have anxiety if you're thinking, did I say something accidentally, sort of maybe out of context, could be considered racist in 1997? I don't know. Maybe. Oh, it's I've, on tape. Oh, I've got things that I, I know for a fact I've probably said a little bit of everything. Yeah. Over the past 20 years in radio, television, YouTube, podcast, whatever it is. I'm sure there's plenty of things that you can yeah. take out of context. I've had pr- plenty of moments where, like, I'm trying to explain, like, I, I got in trouble, you know, a little bit last year. I don't say trouble. It wasn't trouble. Because, mm-hmm. you know, trouble is when you, you know, got to go to jail or yeah. the principal's office. Like, <laughs> I didn't get in no trouble. But people were upset because I was trying to explain rape culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like a few years ago. This whole, that whole concept of rape culture was something new to us. He's like, rape culture? What is rape culture? You know? I, I'm not even sure I know what it is. Is that just, what does that even mean? Uh, basically, just American culture as a whole. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, what, I mean, what, what I mean by that is, like, um, uh, back, remember Back to the Future? Yeah, the movie? Yes. Yeah. And remember when Biff was, uh, Biff, Biff was sexually assaulting? George McFly's mom in the car. Oh yeah, yeah. It's we didn't look at back probably back then. You probably didn't look at that. No, he was just like a as jerk. Sexual assault, but yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. So something like that would fall under, you know. Oh man. The rape yeah. culture. I get that saying? though. That's reasonable because he was wasn't he was like grabbing on her in yeah. the car. Yeah. Uh, I remember Team Vogue had a headline and Team Vogue said is drunk sex rape. You know what I mean? Yeah. But oh, that's man, that's see, tough. See what you did just now? Yeah. You thought about it and you questioned it. Yeah. That's what I did. My dumb ass just questioned it out loud. <laughs> oh, okay. Before, before I had a chance to, like, flesh it out, I was having this conversation with my listeners. And by the way, three, four years ago, it was fine when we were having this conversation with our listeners. But yeah. then four years later, when you want to take it and try to paint another narrative about me, like, oh, Charlemagne's a rapist, then you'll use those clips. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, they, sure. literally, they literally had me saying that it was like, oh, he, look, he admitted he raped his wife. I'm like, no. Said that the first time me and my wife ever had sex twenty years ago, yeah, she was pissy drunk and so was I. Like, yeah, that's the pro- that's why I'm questioning because I'm like, if if everyone, if you both rape each other when you're drunk, then I guess that is. But if what if it's just one person's fault and you're both drunk, that's that's tough. But see that wording, the rape each other. You know what I'm that saying? That doesn't like, make sense. Yeah, it sounds wild. Me. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it like, sounds yeah. It sounds wild, but. I don't have a problem laying on that cross because I just feel like those are conversations men should have with with themselves and with each other because that's the only way, you know, we're going to be able to correct a lot of the bullshit that's out here, right? We want to yeah. make the world a safer place for our women. I got three daughters. I want to make the world a safer place for them. So, I mean, if these are the kind of conversations that, you know, we have amongst each other and we're questioning you know, past behavior, or if I'm saying something, okay, if Team Vogue's asking the question of drunk sex rape, and I'm like, you know what, my guys, the smartest thing to do is when you're both intoxicated, don't do anything. Yeah. Wait until both of y'all are sober, and y'all can make a, a decision from a sober 
perspective. You know what I'm saying? Doesn't matter if she's drunk, doesn't matter if you're drunk, don't matter if you're drunk together. Just if alcohol's involved or drugs or anything, just leave it alone. Yeah. I Simple agree. as that. Yeah. I think that's a convers- I think that's a good conversation to have. It is. Have you ever, by the way, have you ever talked with your guy friends about some of this stuff? It's scary what other guys think. Because you, you and I are Absolutely. thinking like, oh yeah, you know, I would never do I would never like follow a girl into the bathroom. Like, what kind of creep would do that? And then one of your boys will be like, oh, I've done that before. And you'll be like, wait, what? Oh, absolutely. What are you talking about? Absolutely. It's shocking. I mean, look, you know, when you get older, your perspective changes, you, 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 you start seeing things through a different lens, mm-hmm. whether it's that lens of being a 40-year-old man, which I am now, or that lens of being a father, that lens of being a husband. You do start to look at past behaviors and, and, and even things that were normal to you at one point. Like, you like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, I can watch a movie like... Juice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that man, I haven't seen that for a long time. Starring Tupac, Omar, Omar Epps, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I can't remember the other brother's name, but they, they, they're in that movie. And that, throughout that whole movie, Q, played by Omar Epps, is a high school student who's sleeping with a nurse, an older woman. Who, and, and at one point in the movie, the, 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 her ex-husband says to her, you still mess with that young boy? But that was the through line to the movie. There was, it, and it wasn't a part of the movie the way they was even highlighting the fact that this older woman was messing with this young yeah. guy. It was just normal. You know what I mean? Yeah. A movie like Belly, where DMX, DMX is in there and the 16-year-old girl calls DMX's girl and is like, yeah, I'm only 16, so he said we couldn't fuck you, but I did suck his dick the night before last. Like, I'm looking at that shit like, now I'm like, what the fuck? Fuck yeah. was we thinking? I know. What the fuck was going on? Like, I'm, that's my mindset now. Even like I referenced Back to the Future earlier. Yeah. No, Biff was literally trying to sexual assault, sexually assault. And it was kind of a Back to the Future. Essentially, was like you could take your kids to that movie. Yes. And they see that, and, then, and you're just like <laughs> Biff. Yeah. You're not, you're not like this is sexual assault. You're like, look at that guy. He has no manners. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. So it's just like now that I'm old, I'm like, that was wild. Yeah. We were wilding. Like, they were wilding in movies. They were wilding on TV, yeah. wilding in music. So, hey, you know. That's a good point. I, all that stuff, you do look back and you go, what the f-? And sometimes I think, is this just my, like, University of Michigan, like, super liberal education talking? And then, but now it's like, that wasn't liberal enough. But back then I remember thinking, like, wow, everything I know is wrong. Yeah. I didn't, yeah. I didn't, I didn't think that. I went hiking once. This is like one experience where I had. I went hiking once and I get to the top of this hill and there's this like stone or a plaque and it said, uh, this this is a memorial to some guy, forget his name, whatever, the first white man to ever climb this hill. And I was like, why? Who cares about that? <laughs> but back then they were like, oh, this is special because the people who came here before, they were Indians. So they, that did, they didn't matter. Indians probably been up and down that hill so much. Yeah. You know I'm mean? sure. So yeah, technically, yeah, he was the first white man to right. climb that hill, right. but not the first person. Right. Yeah. But it was like, oh, anybody who came here before this white guy didn't matter. Now that this white dude climbed it, put a plaque up there, My make sure God. they put his name on it. My God. And I remember seeing that and going like, dang, you wouldn't see that now. But but yeah, I mean, listen, man, everything we're talking about right now is absolutely true because, yes, it does give you anxiety. But you know, I am at the point where I just don't care no more. And the reason I don't care no more is because I know who I am. Mm-hmm. And I know the work that I put in to grow. I know the work that I put in to evolve. So it's when, you know, and honestly, I still get those feelings. You get phone calls or you get texts. You don't know what somebody's about to tell you. I know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's why I don't even have, like, I, I deleted my Twitter and all of that. because I oh, hate, you did? Yeah, because, I mean, every day it's literally, like, you know, I, my mind goes 99 plus. So that's as much as it goes on Twitter. Mm-hmm. So you just know you got 99 plus messages. My should be in the tens of thousands of people yeah. talking about things that I don't want to talk about no more. Yeah. You th- understand what I'm yeah. saying? Like, like, I don't, like, so what? Okay. That was, you, you pulled up an old tweet. You're, you're pulling up old commentary. I don't care. Like, you can't, you can't judge me by those standards anymore. I'm not that person anymore. None of us are. I would hope not. Muhammad Ali said the person who's still thinking the same at 50 as he was at 30 wasted 20 years of his life. Mm-hmm. So I know I'm not the same person. So I can't, let, I can't let you keep bringing me back. What do you think then when you think about historical figures like, oh, Benjamin Franklin owned slaves. I don't even know if that's, I assume that's true. 
those, do you think that like that's a value from another time, or are you like, no, that was that was still like beyond the pale, messed up? That's a great question. We have these conversations. I mean, it definitely was a value from another time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Benjamin Franklin did own slaves, but from what I read, Benjamin Franklin was one of those people who had empathy towards his slaves. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe Benjamin Franklin didn't own slaves. I can't remember. That's why I said I, I don't know. I can't remember either. It's fuzzy to me now. I always get all the founding fathers mixed up. Pretty I, re much. I, I read that before. Either Benjamin Franklin owned slaves at one point and then realized it was wrong and freed his slaves. Or, or is he... that just what we read because they were like, let's whitewash this shit? Maybe. Yeah. Or he never owned slaves. But either way, that whole concept, the whole concept of slavery, yeah. But. The difference between slavery and a lot of other things, slavery was such an inhumane practice. Yeah. Like, these are human beings we're talking about. Yeah. Like, y you've, we've heard humans scream before. Yeah. You know what and I'm And they saying? could speak. Like, they how are you speak. not yeah. picking up on this? Like, That's this what I don't get. This isn't cattle. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Even then, I, like, I feel bad when I see animals, and I'm not, like, vegan or anything. I'm not, yeah. that, I'm not that empathetic, honestly. But I still, I wouldn't want to see somebody, like, kick a cat ever. So why, how could you have a bunch of people that yeah. you're like, you know what, I need to whip this person. They didn't work hard enough today. That's, that is, yeah. I don't, I can never wrap my mind around that. When you say you know better, you do better. Cool. But what about, is, is it, how can you just move on to doing better after you know better when you've actually murdered people? Yeah. And rape people, and you know, yeah. like killed people's humanity, and you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like sl slavery is a little different, even though that was, don't get me wrong, that was the times, that was the business of the times. But you got to be a certain cruel-hearted, yeah. evil person to even participate, yeah, in that. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no, I just, there's no way that somebody was doing that and wasn't like, this is a little wrong, but I'm gonna do it. There. For sure, everyone felt a little bit like I would like to think people felt a little bit like this is this is messed up. I would hope so. I mean, I mean, I, I would hope that's why the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, <laughs> even though I'm pretty sure it was Political. more so about business and politics than yeah. actual human empathy. But you know, yeah, you would hope, you would hope so. You know, I know you had anxiety plaguing you for a long time, but like. Where did that come from? Because I know last time we talked, we were talking about you were afraid to end up under a tree like other guys from Monk's, Monk's Corner. Corner. Yeah. yeah. And like just be a drunk or like a, I don't know, a drug addict or something like that hanging out. Was that what was driving the anxiety or was there something else to it? Like what? where does it come from? I don't know, man. I've been, you know, unpacking this in therapy for the longest. And like I've always had the feeling. I just never... Knew what it was. I can remember being dropped off in first grade at Memage Elementary School in Charleston, South Carolina, and having a panic attack. You know what I'm saying? Freaking out. I, I can like remember separation that. anxiety from yeah. Past? My mom, my mom dropped me off. I can. I'm sitting here thinking about that day right now. How I was just in tears, bawling. You know what I'm saying? On my yeah. first day of first grade at Memage Elementary School, just crying my eyes out, like not wanting to be left alone in that class and not knowing. Knowing why, like when I think back, when I think back to that, I was I was having a panic attack. It was anxiety, you know. Huh. So I've always I've always had it, you know what I mean. I've always I remember they they would chalk it up. Oh, it's just stage fright, you know what I mean? Like things like that. When it was, you know, came time to like speak in front of the class or, you know, do do. I remember we used to do rock soup. It was a play called Rock Soup. I didn't want to be on stage. Like little things like that. <laughs> so I've always had anxiety, like just. A rational fear and, and didn't quite know why. And I can remember, you know, I write about it in the book about Hurricane Hugo. Yeah. You know? How did that contribute to that? Because that's that's like an illustration of uncertainty. Like, hey, everything could just get blown away, literally washed away. Yeah, I mean, for me, that was, um, I, I, I said in the book that that was the first time I can remember really having anxiety, but no, I, it was definitely not. I think about it more, it was the first grade, but Hugo was different because that's when everybody around me was panicking as well. In first grade, when you're sitting there crying in the class, everybody's like, oh, it's going to be okay, you're fine. Like, my mom, you're going to be fine, whatever, whatever. But Hugo, it's like everybody's like, oh, my God, we might not have a house in the morning. Our trailer might be gone. Oh, we oh, might man. not make it through the night. Like, hell, get in the hallway and you do the hurricane back, you know, whatever you got to do like this, which I don't even know what that protects you from. Nothing. I think it's psychological. <laughs> it's like, uh, all right, do something. Don't just sit there. Yeah. So it was just like, 
that was a, a major panic attack for me. And, and, you know, seeing everybody else flip out around me didn't help the situation at all. Yeah, and, you couldn't reach out and be like, hey, we're good. Everybody was freaking out. Everybody was freaking out. And then, like, the next day, it was just like, yo, this two shall pass. You know, and there was damage everywhere. And yes, people did lose their houses. And yes, people did lose their trailers. But we was alive. You know, so I don't I don't know if the lesson that that taught me was, you know, things things do move on like this, like this two shot path. I don't know if that was the lesson I was supposed to learn from that situation, but I think it did kind of help me cope just a little bit because I was like, if this the worst it can get, then fine. Yeah, we'll figure life out. But you still had anxiety even over the book launch, right? Like what's going on in the head at that point? Because I, I know what anxiety feels like for me is like. Mm-hmm. I go, and Jen, my wife, she knows this. I'll go, huh, well, if this happens, then this could happen, and then this could happen, and then this, and it's like this domino thing that's so ridiculous that if I was making it physically, like if I was setting up these dominoes, it would take me like six hours. That's what life is. I posted a meme the other day, and I was like, um, uh, anxiety. You know everything's gonna go wrong, and then it's like me. Uh, no, it's not. Anxiety, but what if it does? You got me there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Like that's, that's literally how it feels. And like for me, um, what, what drives me crazy about anxiety is I truly believe your thoughts become things. Like I believe the law of attraction. I believe okay. Rhonda Burns is the secret. So it's like the same way you can hold on to positive thoughts and they'll manifest. I feel like if you hold on to negative thoughts too long, they'll manifest. So when you got all of these negative thoughts in your head about what could go wrong and you know, uh, every bad thing that can possibly happen. If you hold on to that for too long, to me, that's when my anxiety kicks in even more because I'm like, all right, the bad thing's going to happen and it's going to be all your fault because you can't stop thinking about it. So for me, that's why I got to, like, flush my anxiety down the toilet. I got to get I gotta get this out of my mind immediately. But it's literally like what you described. Like, anything that can possibly go wrong, I will run that scenario through my head before I get to the one thing that could go right. And my anxiety is so stupid that when everything's going too well, you start to get suspicious. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm like, okay, what's the what's the gag? Where's the shoe gonna drop? Where are the bomb? What's the gag? You know? And that happened to me, that happened to me last year. Like it was just a couple of things that happened to me. It was a few things that happened to me. And it Good was Good things or bad great things? things. Yeah. Great things. Like I mean great things. Everything that I I was going out pitching, I was selling everything. And then it's just like, boom, old tweets come back, old freaking comments from podcasts, old, old charges, you know what I'm saying? Stuff that I've gotten expunged from my record, stuff that I got found not guilty for, stuff that I'm completely innocent of, stuff that I've spoken about, written about it in my books and everything. You know, I'm talking about the the criminal sexual conduct with a minor charge. Like, I spoke about all of this before and it just, it came back and then all of that stuff just went away and I'm like, hey, that's, that's the shoe dropping. Do you think that's a function of like, all right, is hot, every time you go up a couple rungs, somebody's gotta try to take a swipe at you? Cause yeah. it's just a visibility thing. Like, look, Cory Booker, you were just talking about how he was on earlier running for president. We're gonna find somebody from his middle school that was like, oh, you know, he beat up white kids on the playground. Oh, well, <laughs> that means he's racist now or something like that, that's right? Ex- it's gonna be something like that. That's exactly what it is, you know? And um, it comes with the territory. And what I mean when I say it comes with the territory is don't ask for this if you're not willing to accept that as well. And, you know, I'm a stern believer that nothing nothing real can be threatened, you know, and I really, truly do believe in God and I really do believe in the universe. So even when the devil takes a shot at you, even when the devil takes a shot at you, you know, you just got to know that you got on that whole armor of God and he's protecting you, you know, and sometimes he may be blocking you from things that he don't want you to have at this moment. You know what I'm saying? That you may not quite be ready for. Because truth be told, it's things that I lost and still got paid for. Cause <laughs> no, seriously, because they, they even know they know it's like, look, man, we know this is some some bullshit, but hey, we you know, we can't do this on our end because of right. the climate that we're in. But So they just do your payout and then here's the check. Cool. I'd rather yeah. have the opportunity. Sure. But hey. Con- good consolation prize. Great to pay consolation for prize. Great. I I got great consolation prize. So it's just like... Your agent must love that because he's like, so let me get this straight. We don't have to do the work. 
but we get the money and I get yeah. to take a cut of that and go sell something else. Well, right. You know, what people don't realize, like nowadays, you have moral clauses in everything, right? Yeah. Moral clauses, moral clauses, uh, really only affect what you got going on right now. Like if you do some shit today, like if this some shit from 15, 20 years ago that was public, like I'm a public figure. Like I, I put everything. I, my my, this, my truth is all I have. Yeah. My experience is all I have. I don't hide anything. So all of this stuff is people's things that people knew about. Whether it's old comments, old tweets, old charges. I talk about all my criminal charges. I talk about everything I've ever been arrested for. Here, it's all on the table. Yes, I sold crack. Yes, I was sitting in the backseat of a car. My man shot a, a pistol. Yes, I did. That, that happened. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't hide anything from my life because I truly feel like sometimes God lets things happen to you so he can work through you. And I think that it's up to all of us as individuals. We have to share our experiences because they will help other people. Yeah, well, I agree with that. You know what I'm saying? So even if I got, if I got to go through the shit, because I shared too much, fine. I'm cool with that. Because guess what? I reap the rewards too. So the same way I reap the so-called punishments or I take the so-called backlash in the heat, I get the rewards too, you know? And, and I got to take the good with the bad. Like those same words that I've uttered throughout my career have gotten me to this position. So those same words might cause me some heat every now and again too. But guess yeah. what? I'm fine with that. I'm perfectly fine with it. I mean, you're right. It does help other people because I I had to start my show over in 2018 in February. Mm -hmm. So I started from scratch and I thought, and I remember thinking, if Charlemagne can get fired four times and be where he is now, I can get fired once and be, I'll be all right. I got, I got three more firings to go before I even have to worry oh, about man. it. Firings, that's light. Yeah. That, honestly, that's, I'm, not, I'm so not scared of those nowadays, but that's because... You've been through it? Well, that's because I still shop at Target. And I get a lot of free clothes, and I've saved a lot of money. Okay, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So you can afford like, to get fired. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to, but yeah, I could. And plus, you know, like that's why ownership is so important. Like, you just yeah. have to have other outlets of of revenue to make money. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I have I have one job, meaning that I work for iHeartRadio. Mm -hmm. Great corporation, by the way. iHeart yeah. is the best corporation in the motherfucking world. Good, I, well played. I'm, I'm being honest, know, just, just because of the way they ride for their talent, you know what I'm saying? The way Bob Pittman and Richard Bressler, you know, ride for their talent, and my, my, my boss, Thea Mitchum, like, they just good people, man. Doc Winters, they ride for their talent, and, you know, I, that's my only job, and that's the job I don't mind having, because I don't mind working for those individuals. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I really don't. And, and it's really a partnership. We work together on a lot of things. But all my other sources of income come from good investments and things that I own, whether it's the podcast, whether it's the books, whether it's the TV production company, whatever it is. So, yeah, me getting fired right now, that wouldn't scare me in no way, shape, or form. Plus, it never scares me because it's just always like sometimes when you're not ready to move, God will move you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The universe will move you and say, you know what? You should really be doing this right now instead of that. And you just got to embrace it. You said in your last book, shit is the best fertilizer. Yes, sir. So I like that because it, it does, that has played out in my own life too. Like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? And then you raise your game up because you go, I got to start over after 11 years. What am I going to do? Be the best at something else or at the same thing. But you got to do a hard reset. It's like a kick in the ass that you wouldn't, that you would not have gotten if you weren't backed into a corner. Like, Word up. You just don't know. Sometimes you're forced to fight. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know how strong you are until you're forced to fight, until you're backed in that corner. And all you got to do is, all you have left to do is throw some motherfucking punches. Yeah. And some kicks and whatever, and you fight your way out that corner. And then now you're looking at your opponent, and he on the ground, and you're standing over him. You know what I mean? Like, that's very, very rare. You know? It's, 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 very, it's very rare for a lot of people to get in that corner and fight their way out. Some people get in that corner, and they, like, give up. They tap out. You know, I've never been one of those tap out type people because I really don't have, I, don't, I really don't have any other options. You know, and that's why in the book Shook One, I use this acronym for fear, called face everything and rise, or fear everything and run. And I mean, sometimes that's what I do. I use my anxiety as fuel. You know, when I get those feelings in my stomach, when I get those feelings in my gut, it, it's just like, damn, this means something to me. You know what I mean? It means something to me. Like, so if it means something to me, then I gotta be willing to fight for it. You know, and that's what I do. I, I, I face my fears and I rise up from it. I like that. I, and I thought, so forget everything and run is, is, do you consider that bad or you consider that an option? So face everything and rise or forget everything and run. Do you consider them both options or you always fight? 
Both of them are options. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I almost got jumped in front of the radio station back in, like, 2012. I know. I remember. Yeah. About that. Guy walked up behind me, punched me in the back of the head. You know, I don't know what's behind me. So I run up a little bit when I turn around. I see dude. I see another dude with the camera. And I see two more dudes coming, running at me. So I'm like, oh, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Because yeah. this, is, this is a plan. This is a plot. So this was, like, viral video while Charlamagne Absolutely. Up? So it's like it's crazy. And, and it, the, the day before they tried to set it up, you know, the day before they 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 it was like a let me see if he's by himself, let me see who's out here with him. Like it was a, they set it up the day before. Day after they made their move. So it's just like for me, I'm not letting y'all plan go through. I don't know what y'all got planned, but this guy got a camera. This dude hit me in the back of the head. Two dudes running across the street. They might have laid me on the street and pissed on me or sure. something. Like I don't know what your plan was, but I wasn't sticking around to find out. So do, do you know now what that was all about? That's weird. I still don't know to this day. That's why you got wax hanging out, though. Well, yeah, right? and to keep him out of trouble. Oh, uh, yeah? You know what I'm saying? Double, like, that's my, like, but that's, like, that's something that would have happened anyway. That's my, that's my brother for 17 years. You know? Shit, no longer now. No, 17. 2019. I met, I met Wax in 02 when he was in college. You know what I'm saying? At Benedict. Well, at the time, he was going to Allen University. Then he transferred to Benedict. Uh, in Columbia, South Carolina, and I was doing radio on the Big DM 101.3, then eventually uh, Hot 103.9. So it's just like the same things me and Wax are doing now, we've been doing. You know, like, he was with me all the time then. But it's now he's with me all the time, and I can afford to pay him six figures. Yeah. And that's a great yeah. feeling, you yeah. know? And plus it keeps him out, like I said, keeps him out of trouble. You know what I mean? I and, can see him going, getting bored and doing something. Yeah, he's, yeah. Cha- he's grown a lot, though. He's grown tremendously. I mean, he's talking about somebody I met when they was like 22 years old, now they 35. Like, you know what oh, I'm yeah. saying? Different, yeah. total different ball game. We got kids now. Like, you know, he's got a chicken farm. You know, he's, he's got, got a chicken farm. He's got his own chicken farm. Oh, man. Well, that's got a degree in business from Benedict. You know, like he. Oh, it's got, a commercial chicken farm. Yeah. Oh, sells. I thought maybe he just had like a handful no, no, of No, no, no. He sells chickens. He sells organic chickens my wife will love that she wants a chicken farm yeah she can't wait yeah you gotta talk to wax jen we'll get get the chicken discount chicken hookup it's funny that's another form of my anxiety too though what is just making sure that i uh my people are taken care of yeah you know what i'm saying you never feel like you're doing enough that keeps me up at night too for sure you never feel like you're doing enough for your people you know what i'm saying you feel like you could always be doing more you could always be putting them in a better position you know what i'm saying you want to you know, you want to acquire more so you can give them more, you know. But sometimes it's just about giving them an opportunity to do do things on their own, mm-hmm. you know. So hopefully I'm that kind of person. Hopefully I'm that kind of leader that's, that's, that's doing that, you know. Do you still get social media-induced anxiety? Like, are you still, I know you got rid of Twitter, but you're still on Instagram. Do you look at other people's and you're like, oh, man, I should be doing this? Yeah, I just read this great book called Digital Minimalism. Yeah, I just interviewed Cal Newport yesterday. Wow, yeah. I can't wait to interview him, man. Yeah, he's great. Have you read the book? Yeah. That shit is going to be a game changer. I know. That shit is going to be one of those generational, like, yo, you, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying this as no shameless plug. I really feel like this generation needs to read Shook One Anxiety Playing Tricks on Me, which is my book on anxiety and, you know, just me dealing with my mental health and therapy and stuff like that. And... Cal Newport, Digital Minimalism. This book is so amazing because everything I was going through, he put in this book. Yeah. And so now he's just giving me more tips and more tools on how to handle what I already already realized. Social media is not good for your mental health. That shit is fucking us up. We are not wired to always be wired. Like, we're literally in the information age, but everybody's, everybody's more engaged then they are actually informed. Oh yeah, that's that's a really good point. Yes, and and we all fucking like you get this, you get these this, these bits of information. We don't know if it's factual, we don't know if it's a lie, we don't know what's what. Right. But, but I'll share that we shit. We share it. Yeah. And we come to these conclusions about it, and we we we're arguing about things, and we got all of these hypotheticals, and we based whole opinions and perceptions around these sh- these things that aren't even real. So what I learned to do is I refuse to be outraged, Jordan. You refuse to be outraged. I refuse to be outraged. He's like, no, I'm not. I refuse that. to be outraged cuz nothing is what it nothing is what it seems on social media. You're only getting a bit of it. You know what I'm saying? Like you could think about, you know, when you saw the 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 kid in the MAGA hat 
faced off with the Native American. Yeah. And I'm watching that clip. I'm like, I'm not going to repost this because I don't know what the whole context of this is. Then you get the whole context and you realize that it wasn't what we thought it was. What was that all about? I didn't even get the whole context. I just looked at it and I was like, if I was on the news and had a camera in my face, I'd have a weird look on my face too. I don't know if that kid's racist or if he's just uncomfortable. It was, I don't know. It, it was three groups. You had the black Israelites, you had the Native Americans, you had the kids in the MAGA hats. Um, the black Israelites were screaming things at both parties. Uh, the Native Americans came over playing the drums to like try to intervene between the black Israelites and the kids, but they were facing the kids. The kids start dancing and stuff, because listen, you gotta be a real soulless piece of shit to not appreciate some good ass drums, okay? <laughs> okay? So the Native Americans are playing the drums. I don't care when them drums is going, I don't care what if you're a racist, bigot, whatever, them drums gonna move you. The point is it's supposed to get you it's moving, It's supposed right? to get That's you moving. So they started moving, and then I guess some of the Native Americans or somebody thought that they were mocking them, and then the Native American walked closer to the crowd, and then this kid walks down, and it just looked, it looked worse than what it was, basically. You know what I'm saying? But it was a lot more moving parts to it than just this Native American, I mean, this, this guy in a MAGA hat walking up on the Native American trying to, trying to punk him or being disrespectful. Like, it was a lot more to it than yeah. what that clip showed us. So I didn't repost that, you know what I'm saying? Because like I said, I refuse to be outraged until I get all the context of something. Like even a situation like 21 Savage getting deported by ICE. When I see that in my mind, I'm like, that can't be the full story. This guy is a 25, 26 year old rapper. All of a sudden ICE is just right pull, pulling him over. And, and he's from like the UK, he's from like London or something. Dominica, right? he was born on an island called Dominica. Oh, okay. The UK owned this island. He moved here when he was five years old. You know what I'm saying? He so moved here? He moved to America when he was five. So how do you deport somebody who's been here for 20 years? I don't know. Like, you what? know, like I'm like all of this stuff is like, huh? So when I see, but when I see stuff like that, the news is reporting he moved here when he was 14. And then, you know, he uh he got arrested in 2014. Like it's just all kind of like stuff that can't be possibly true. Mm -hmm. So you mean to tell me this guy has been living here for 14 years and never mentioned it? He's been here since he was five. He's smart enough to know, hey, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm not here illegal, legally, so I'm trying to figure it out. I mean, it's a long story behind yeah. that that I'm skipping over, but he's not he, he's not here illegally. Like his he's got younger brothers and sisters. All of them are you know citizens because they were born here and under Barack Obama's Dreamers program, yeah. they became citizens. But he's the oldest one. His mom had put in the paperwork, and then he turned 18, so he ended up having to do it himself. So he's just been in this holding pattern, waiting to. Become a citizen, basically. The guy paid 1.8 million dollars in taxes last year. Like, what do you like? Yeah. What do you like? No, come back. He's like, not the one. Pay those taxes. Yes. Yeah. Like, ice, ice. You're going after the wrong guy. Yeah. I'm saying all that to say you see these stories and you really don't know the whole story. So I'm not. I can't come to an opinion about with, with limited information. I just won't do it. And you know, the the book Digital Minimalism has been so good for me, man. To answer your question after saying all of that other shit, it has been so good for me because. Nothing causes anxiety the way social media causes anxiety. And I'm just at that point in my life where I don't need to be a part of every conversation. No, definitely not. Especially, how do you focus on what matters? Because you got millions of followers on social media. It's gotta be hard for you to ignore social media, but also kind of need it for business and, and have to be a part of it at that level. Well, like Cal says in the book, Digital Minimalism, you gotta treat it like a tool. Yeah. You got to treat it like a resource. You use it when you need it. You know, like um, I'm on the air 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. So, yeah, I'll be on social media. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's another practice that he talks about in the book where he talks about, you know, um, do it for an hour a day. Indulge. It's like a cheat meal. Mm -hmm. You know? like if Cheat you, meal, yeah. Yeah, if you want to go on social media for an hour late, late at night or when you're not doing nothing, fine. Just go. But after that hour... No more. Yeah, schedule it out. Get schedule it, done. it out. You know what I mean? And, and I think that's actually dope. So it's just like little things like that. Like I deleted Snapchat off my phone, deleted Facebook off my phone, deleted Twitter off my phone. The thing I got on my phone is Instagram, you know? And, and when I realized that it was really having a toll on my mental health is when I went on vacation on December 27th. You know, we do big family, family vacations every year where we go away for the last two weeks of the year. Well, the last, the last week of the year and then the first week of the new year. And I, I love this island called Anguilla. It's like the most beautiful place in the world. It gives me such, you know, great peace of mind. And um, I got on the plane, 
On the 27th, I turned the phone off. I threw it in my wife's bag. And right then and there, I said, yo, I'm not touching my phone this whole trip. And I did not touch my phone the whole trip. No social media, no emails, no text messages, no phone calls. It was to the point where, like, close friends of mine was emailing my wife, like, where are y'all? What's up? Like, and, like, no. I, I had no re Why? My daughters are with me. My wife's with me. My, I got friends with me, family, like who I need to talk to in this moment. You know what I mean? I wasn't talking to nobody. When I tell you that my brain felt like it reset, like it felt like it was like parts of my brain that were missing that were growing back. And I like that feeling. And, you know, I can't let uh, that smartphone take away that sense of peace. You know what I'm saying? I just, I can't do it. Do you wake up and check your phone, or do you schedule it out for after you're done on the show? Like, when do you do it? I check my phone at uh, around 5.45 every morning. So I wake up at 4.20. Um, I pray, take a shower, read my daily affirmations. I got two of them. Um, I read The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday, and I read um, uh, Your Best Life by Joel Osteen. And after I read my affirmations, I get in the car, and I either listen to some 90s R&B, or I listen to Oprah Super Soul Conversation, or I listen to nothing, you know? Because No I just, Jordan Harbinger show, huh? Done with not that. Yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Snip that out. Oprah so, Oprah so, no, I, I, listen to, I listen to your podcast, but I'm saying Oprah so soothing in the morning. Oh, yeah. Don't listen to me in the morning, man. That's too much. <laughs> I can't even listen to myself in the morning. No, Oprah's just so in the morning. Her voice, her tone, her demeanor, the way she talks to her guests. I she know. put her guests always are in the same tone as her. And it's always something very informative, very educational, very spiritual. Yeah. You know, so it's just like that's like that's what I like to set the tone with. Yeah, she's morning. great. I feel like before you go on that show, she must be like, drink this C B D tea that I mm -hmm. got for you. Or she's like, you probably have to like meditate with her assistant for twenty minutes before she lets you in the house. Exactly. Like that. Because everybody on the show is always like, oh, hey, how, how are you? I can't even get there. You definitely can't. It, like, on your show, you're never that calm. Nah. That's not your thing, though. Nah. I mean, it depends who I'm talking to, but I'm just like a... I get excited. You, that, you're good at that, though. I admire that about you. Yeah. Like, I saw you on Bill Maher, and my wife goes, oh, don't we know him? I was like, yeah, Charlamagne. She goes, oh, right. And you're, like, funny, and you're on... But you're always like that. You're not, you don't walk in and go like, all right, I gotta be cool now. Like you're doing that out in the hallway. I heard you in the hallway. Yeah, because the easiest thing to be is yourself. Yeah. And one thing I realized at 40 years old is I don't know who the fuck I am right now. I am having that, I don't wanna say problem. I'm having that phenomenon happen. Is it because right of now. therapy? Uh, Probably introspection, therapy, yeah. slash like having a hard reset last year and going, well, what do I want now? I didn't want to do the other thing. That thing ended. Now I get to reset. I don't want to just jump into something because it's convenient. It's like when you break up with somebody. Yeah. You, you can either jump into another relationship with somebody and then you're like, okay, I guess I'm in this. Or now, guys our age, we want to be conscious with it. So it's yeah. different. I was listening to somebody on Oprah's Super Soul Conversation. I don't remember who it was. I want to say it was Eckhart Tolle, but don't quote me on that. And I remember, it was so funny because I'm riding and that's what he said. He goes... If you don't know who you are, that's a good thing. Well, that's a relief. Yeah, but because I'm like, yo, because you got to think at 40, I'm unlearning everything I've, 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 I've learned because it doesn't serve me anymore. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just in this new space of fatherhood, even though my daughter's 10, my other daughter's three, I got a four month old and, you know, being a faithful husband, like giving my all to my wife, like not getting caught up in the lifestyle and being out here cheating on my wife or anything like that, like being a faithful husband, like all of this is new spaces to me, you know what I'm saying? And um, it's a great space, but the wildest thing in the world is when you realize, damn, everything I thought I knew, I don't know. Yeah, and all the things you thought were important are not, are not important at all. At all, like complete bullshit. You I know? bet there was a time where you thought, I'm going to get a lot of Instagram followers. It's going to be amazing. That must have been a thing at some point. Everybody yeah, knows. Twitter was, you know what's so funny? Instagram kind of just came with the territory. Twitter was also, Twitter was definitely one of those things like, oh, I got to get more Twitter followers, more Twitter followers. Mm -hmm. When Instagram just sort of happened, like it was almost like all the Instagram followers, the Twitter followers just started going over to Instagram. I ended up getting more Instagram followers than I did Twitter by accident. Mm -hmm. And so like for me, it's like, okay, cool. I got the Twitter, I got the Instagram followers, the Twitter followers. 
shit. Even um, well, another thing that you know had me trying to figure things out is when you become a millionaire. Mm-hmm. You know, not a not even just a one millionaire, but you got a few million in the bank. You know what I'm saying? Like, you never expected that of yourself. Probably never thought of it. Like, not, not, I mean. Of course you think of it. Well, you wished for it to happen, but you don't think like I'm I, you, I it's seeing the zeros is different. I just wish to be successful. Mm-hmm. I just wish to be successful and just like, you know, old habits are uh when you when you used to sell when I used to sell crack, I used to like to see my bank account just get I used to like to see that not just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You kept the money in the bank from the crack sale? No, 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 no. I mean, like literally the not Oh, oh, literally. So the money, okay, like okay. the knot was bigger, bigger. Like, you know what I mean? It's hundreds, 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 like that big knot. It might have been just three, four thousand dollars. Sure. I just like having that big knot. And it's just like now I like seeing those zeros accumulate. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And you're looking at these, you're looking at this shit like, oh, well, wow. I I didn't when did that happen? Like, yeah. Oh, oh, did, oh, this check now? Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's just like things happen really fast and but then you got to be careful with that right because what if you look at that and then something happens and you got to spend it help out a family member it goes down the drain somehow i'm fine with that, yeah. I'm fine with that yeah. because because i don't have vices i don't i'm not a jewelry guy i'm not a car guy i'm not stunting at the script club like i don't have any of those vices that's why i think god waited god knew when to bless me with oh these yeah things. you know what i'm saying i don't have nothing to prove you know what i'm saying i don't got no side kids i got to take care like i don't have any of that you know what I'm saying? So literally, that's where my money goes to. My money goes to investing in myself, but also investing in others because I always want to be the adult that I needed when I was a kid. I can think about all the times when I was a young up and coming radio personality and it was things that I wanted to do. I had ideas for certain things, but you know, financially it may have stopped me from doing things the way I wanted to. So I get a kick out of watching my youngins, you know, the people I call my nieces, like, prosper you know what i'm saying if they need something and it can help their career in a different way like yeah yeah go go do that i just i just get a kick out of that out of helping other people that yeah but the anxiety comes from what if i what what if i can't do this Mm -hmm. anymore like maybe that's what you're saying to your yeah like Like, what if yeah like will i still be like you might and i'm not trying to put a negative question in your head but you someone in your position might think Will people still care about me the same if I can't be as helpful as I am right now? Like, I would worry about that. Yeah, you're right. But that's why help isn't always financial. Of course, of course. You know what I'm saying? I feel like anybody can be a public servant. Like, I, I feel like we're all, that's, that's what I feel like my main role is. I'm here to serve the needs of the public. You know, Wayne W. Dyer said that your true purpose in life comes through service of others. So I really feel that way. So. You can be the richest man or the poorest man. You can be of service to somebody. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You might have a bottle of water and give a homeless person. You know what I'm saying? You might can buy a homeless person a, a, a cup of hot cocoa. You might can help somebody with their luggage on the plane. Anybody, any of us can be of service. You might just have some experience and some knowledge that a youngin might need. You know? So anybody can be of service. So it's not always about financial. Dr. Ish, in your book, I thought it was cool how you have your therapist also chime in it's like every other chapter and he kind of breaks down an idea in a, in a very therapisty kind of way well he's, he's, he's not it's just my real therapist um i want I, I wanted to use my real therapist but then again i didn't because i want to be selfish that's my yeah my therapist and what i was trying to do i was actually trying to uh transcribe everything my therapist was telling me mm-hmm. so those stories in the book was things i would be talking to my therapist about and then she would you know give me her diagnosis on it and I was trying to transcribe that, but I realized that what she was telling me wasn't for me to share with people. Yeah. It was just for me to have a better understanding of what I was going through so I could share my experiences with people. But I wanted to have a doctor in the book. So my book agents, um, Nina and Jan, they just had the idea of using Dr. Ish. And um, Dr. Ish was great. He came with those yeah. clinical correlations. He's, he seems really sharp. I'm, one thing I love that he said was our brains will answer any question we ask of it, so we gotta make sure to ask good questions. Because I find that I'm still in many ways uh, childish in that I blame myself for things that happened to me, which I didn't realize cognitively, like I didn't realize consciously at the time, probably until I read your book, that children think that way. Like, oh, mom and dad left me at the grocery store, so that means I'm bad, or mom and dad got divorced, that means something about me. 
I think I still do that to a certain extent, but I think probably all adults might do that. Because why would we outgrow that? It seems like a weird thing to outgrow, you know? Yeah, I definitely still do that. You know what I mean? That's why I beat myself up over any and everything, yeah. you know? But sometimes, man, you have to realize that it has nothing to do with you. Like, you know, we take things personal way too much. Yeah. You know, like a lot yeah. of times we, 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 we I, I have no reason to take things personal. Like sometimes people are just assholes. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes people are just fuck boys. You know what I'm saying? Like that's yeah. just the truth to the matter. So it's like sometimes you encounter these fuck boys and you encounter these assholes. And when you encounter them, their negative energy comes into your, your circumference. And like you got to deal with that negative energy. And sometimes you hold on to it yourself and you're like, damn, why didn't I see that coming? Or damn, why did I stick around this long with this person? Or, you know, why did I allow them to talk to me like that? And it's just like, man, that's just life. That's just the way that it is. You're going to encounter people like that throughout your journey. And you just got to like, you got to just shake it off. Like, it's, it's not on you. Like, you know, but I, I, I still do. I blame myself for a lot of things. But I mean, but I think I don't think there's nothing wrong with accountability. I don't think there's nothing wrong with holding yourself accountable for things you may have said, things you may have done. Because even if, like, for example, if somebody pulls up old tweets of mine and our old commentary and they put it out, yeah, you can get mad at that person, but you did say it. Yeah, sure. You did tweet it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I'm not going to beat myself up about it because I don't know who that motherfucker was 10 years ago. I'm talking about me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I don't know what I was on. 10 years ago. I just know it was some bullshit and I'm not on that now, you know? Yeah, so we have to kind of be okay. I don't want to say forgive yourself, but to realize, yeah, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago and that's that's normal and I'm not gonna feel bad about about that stuff. You didn't kill nobody. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody's dead because of something that you said, uh, something that you did. Like there's certain things that, you know, you can never get over. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe, I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to say never get over. I just don't know if I could get over s certain things that could happen to somebody that'd be permanent. You know what I'm saying? Like permanent damage that was caused to a person. But like nine times out of ten, you, you understand the role you played in whatever the situation was. Yeah. Like even, even when, like I say, even when you said something or tweeted something, like that's 100% you. As long as you know you're not there anymore or you can look back on something and say damn that makes me uncomfortable to even see that I said that now see that I tweeted that the lesson has been learned you know what I'm saying it's a yeah. lesson not a life sentence you know what I'm saying like you was, was a lesson in that situation it's not a life sentence it's not something to hold on to until you die new idea for a Facebook social media feature automatically after three years two years just be like oh can't go f back any further I think it should be four four years because that's graduation Oh, yeah. So you know after you graduate, yeah. it's like, boom, middle school's cut off. You go graduate from college, high school's cut that's off. That's it. That's it. Like, that's college. It's four years sometimes. Unless you go get a master's, I think it should be four years. I think every four years, every like just like a presidential term, we should be seeing where people are. You know what I'm saying? Where are they at in their lives? Has there been growth? Has there been evolution? Can we see it? If we can see it, cool. You know what I'm saying? Move on. Only time you should be digging up old stuff is when the person's behavior hasn't changed and they're still exhibiting the same behaviors now that they did 10 years ago. So yeah. then you can pull it up and say, look, this motherfucker has a history of this bullshit. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. How glad are you, by the way, that stuff you did pre-social media is not archived or memorialized anywhere that people can get it easy. Like you and I are in a weird situation because we got 10, 20 years of radio or something that people could dig up, but... Before that, I don't know. For most of us, I think at least we weren't like on our phone in a bad mood, typing something, send, tweet, whatever. The and worst. Like, oh, the worst. Um, I don't know. I mean, I got a bunch of air checks, and yeah. I would have to go back and listen to some of those air checks. I mean, for, from from what I know, I've always been this way. You know what I'm saying? Like, Which way? Just me. Like I've been yeah. just always open, honest. Um, I don't think I got caught up in any shtick of doing things that probably wasn't me until Breakfast Club. So you think the the stuff that happened that you regret or that you maybe not regret, that you think got you in trouble is a result of of what? You being not not yourself or like you trying to be something different? I think that when you are a radio personality, TV personality, author, whatever it is, when you're a public figure mm -hmm. and you see things about yourself, meaning like people write up things about you in magazines. Yeah. 
people say things about you on social media, YouTube comments. I think subconsciously, if you're taking all of this shit in, then you 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 start giving people what you think they want. You start seeing what people like about you and subconsciously you start giving them yeah, that. Yeah, you amplify that. Yeah. yeah. Without even really knowing it. You know what I'm saying? You give you you give them that. Like somebody like, oh Charlemagne's a black Howard Stern. You're like, oh. <laughs> so this is what y'all like. But then it's like what Howard are we talking here? Cause if we talking eighty nineties Howard, that's just the times up me too shit waiting to happen. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? But if you're talking about Howard now, then you're talking about a married man who has done a lot of therapy, is a great interviewer, a great observationist. So it's just like, what are you, which Howard are you referring to? Sure. Me, maybe not knowing any better. Okay, they must be talking about wild, crazy, out of control Howard. You know, so you start doing more of that. You start saying wild shit in interviews. You start saying creepy shit in interviews. You know what I'm saying? You, you do that, you know, subconsciously. And then... People check you, you know? People check you. Your, your homegirls check you. Your wife checks you. And then you sitting back and you observing your own behavior and you're like, oh, that was whack. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like simple things. Like I remember I used to always refer to women as vintage vagina. And Ooh, tell, yeah. and, and, and tell a woman, and which I thought was a compliment. You know what I'm saying? Cause in my oh, I see. Yeah, because yeah, it's like, yo, any woman that's over the age of 40 who's aging like wine and not milk. And then your homegirls say to you, you shouldn't say that because you're reducing a woman to their body parts. And you're like, Oh, I never thought about it. You know what I'm saying? I just mm -hmm. thought that was a compliment. I, mean, I, I used to tell women, I want to suck a fart out your butt. <laughs> I used to say it was a top five list of women who's, who I wanted to suck a fart out their butt. To me, that's a new way of saying I drink your bath water, uh -huh, which yeah. is just as disgusting. Just as, so it's just as disgusting, but I'm just saying it in a modern way. All right? yeah, yeah. You know? And people are like, suck a fart out your butt. I'm like, yeah, it's like a bong hit. And everybody laughs. So, you know, that was some shit I, would, it, I used to say. But uh, then, I can't tell if I'm laughing because it's uncomfortable or because it's funny. That's why I'm on that line. Like, I think it's line. both. It is both. You know, but then you realize, like, um, that's not nothing to be saying to women yeah. either. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I'm say, like I said, you go through all of these different things where you listen to all of these things people are saying about you, what, thing, what, what people like, and you subconsciously give them that. And then you, you know, realize, like, that shit is whack. Like, Especially know? if you play to the wrong, because look, like there's a lot of people who write in. They're like, "Oh, I love the intelligent interviews. You get good stuff out of your guests. You know, you ask Charlemagne questions about stuff that we can use, not just about drama, whatever." So, so I could play to that, and that would make me better. But often those aren't the loud people. The loud people are the ones who are like the lowest common denominator. Yeah. And so you play to them, you're turning up the wrong volume. Yeah. If you're you're amplifying the wrong stuff. And that's what I did. You know, and, and that's why I sternly believe that in order to truly lead, lead the orchestra, you got to turn your back on the crowd altogether. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's, yeah. that's what I have been doing for the past four to five years, whether people realize it or not, you know. And it's just like there's certain things. Like I wanted to put more medicine in the candy. You know, I want, and that's why you see more spiritual leaders on Breakfast Club. You see more political people, you know, you got entrepreneurs, like just things that our community can really mm -hmm. use in between the Soldier Boys and the Takashi 6 9s and the Kodak Blacks and all that ratchet shit. But even, even it's, it's jewels in there, you know? The only thing I was trying to tell Takashi 6 9 was like, bro, if you don't change your lifestyle, you're gonna end up in jail or dead. You know, people thought it was a game. Like they thought I was trolling him when I first had him on. Breakfast Club, but nah, like watching guys like him really, they give me anxiety. Cause I'm mm -hmm. like, bro, I know how this is gonna end. Like, this ain't yeah. new. Like, this is a rerun. I've seen your kind a million times. Like this rap shit is not gonna save you. This rap shit didn't save Biggie. This rap shit didn't save Pac. What makes you think it's gonna save you? You know where near big as them. You know what I'm saying? So now he's in jail. So now I can look back on that moment and use that as a teachable moment. To these, to these youngies. Yeah. You know? So you think being a good example is important? Because I definitely think being a good example is really important. And I get disappointed when I see people with a lot of influence be like, it's not my responsibility to be a good person. Like, these kids, they make their own decisions. They make decisions based on looking at, at people like you and I and that they can relate to. And then they, they choose... What, there are people that ask, what would, Char what would Charlamagne do in this situation? And if they think, oh, he'd say some ratchet-ass shit, they're going to do that. You're right. You're 100% correct. Um, that's, yeah, I think that being, 
I think that being a good influence is super important because whether or not, whether we realize it or not, we are influencing a whole nother generation. Mm -hmm. Like I get, I get that all the time. I met my daughter's cheerleading competition yesterday. One of the security dudes comes sit by me. He goes, man, I learned so much from you. Bro, I write books. I talk for a living. <laughs> like, like they, I'm sure they're learning something from me. You know Hopefully, what I mean? Yeah. And all I'm doing is sharing my experiences. I'm not an expert at nothing. All I have is some experiences that I've decided to share with people. Good, bad, ugly. Doesn't matter. I'm sharing it all. And I think that, you know, yeah, it's our duty to, 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 to influence people in the right way. You know what I'm saying? I love, you know, watching people gravitate towards the Angela Rye. I love, you know, when people start, you know, paying attention to uh, Pastor John Gray, you know, because of the Breakfast Club, like whatever it is. Like, mm -hmm. I love bringing these new voices or these elders, these OGs. I love bringing them on our platform and like saying, here. We gave you this candy last week. We gave you this candy yesterday, but here's some medicine. You know what I'm saying? I love when Cory Booker, Kamala Harris wants to come on the Breakfast Club because they want to talk to our audience. You know what I'm saying? Like they want, they know that we have a certain amount of influence and they want to co op that for a little bit. I don't have a problem with that as long as you're putting the right things out there yeah. to our people. You're a massive proponent of therapy now, though, huh? Yes. What? I mean, I won't ask what prompted that because we kind of know already that it's good for everyone. But why Why do you love it? Why do you think, because you're in your book, you're like, everybody should do this. Everybody should do this. I love it because, you know, for me, I'm a person who likes to talk. You know what I'm saying? I like to, I like to vent. Like, it, it, it eats me up when I got to keep things on my chest. And, and it's things that, you know, I have yet to share with the world that I can't wait to share with the world one day because I know that these things are holding me back, you know. They're these, just like baking in the oven right now, ready? To they're just baking in the yeah. oven and I'm just waiting for the right opportunity to speak on a lot of things that have happened to me, in particular in this industry, you know what I'm saying? Hmm. Um, and yeah, I just, I just can't wait to have those conversations, but until I can have those conversations publicly, yeah, I gotta have those conversations with my therapist. You know, it's different, you know, it's one thing to share things with friends, it's one thing to share things with your wife, but, you know, sometimes you just need that professional opinion, you know, to make sure that, make sure you're not bugging out. And, you know, therapy to me is like, it's, it's, it's really like having a junky ass closet and you got clothes everywhere in the closet, sneakers everywhere in the closet, and then you go in there with an organizer and you start packing away things that you don't want anymore, things that don't serve you. You ship those off to Goodwill. The things you want to keep, you fold them up, you hang them up nice and neat, you organize them, you know what I'm saying? And then that way you got room to bring in new stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what therapy is to me. And I think about how, like, my father, who I love, he told me for the first time over Thanksgiving of last year that he was going to therapy two and three times a week that he tried to kill himself 30 something years ago, you know, but he didn't because he saw a picture of me and my sister and wow. my mom. And at the time, there's only four of us at the time. Come out, two younger brothers and younger sisters weren't born yet. But yeah, he, he wanted to kill himself and he's going to, he went to therapy two and three times a week. He tried 10 to 12 different medications, you know, for his mental health and he gets a check for mental health issues. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like, yo, if I didn't know that when I was a kid, then I would have known why I would get depressed sometimes. Or I would have these extreme highs and these extreme lows. Or I would have known about my anxiety, you know? Like, I would have been able to get a handle on all of this stuff a lot earlier. And I probably wouldn't be 40 years old not knowing who the hell I am right now, you know? So I encourage everybody to go to therapy the same way I encourage everybody to work out. Same way I encourage everybody to go to the gym. <laughs> That's what therapy is. You know what I'm saying? Therapy is just some, some brain calisthenics. You know what I mean? Go. Go and get that flushed out. You know, like it's like giving your brain a bath. That's how I, that's how I, that's how I look at it. And I love it. I thought it was interesting that you said most black people like don't go to therapy. It's just not a thing that you do in the community or whatever. I, I mean, I think that's true for a lot of people, but I didn't even think about it being specifically not that common among people in the black community. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, think about how many resources black people already don't have. 
So I, I, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I never, obviously, yeah. of course, I don't think about so, that. So, that so growing up in the hood, yeah, or growing up in a rural area like most corners of South Carolina, it's just like a lot of resources and stuff we already don't have. So why would therapy be on that list? You know what I'm saying? And most of the therapists are white. So why would a black person go and sit down and talk to a white person about their problems when in their mind a white person has caused probably 90% of those problems, you know? So that's all I think it is. It's just a lack of information and a, and a lack of resources. Like those, like those resources genuinely are not available. And if they are, nobody's talking about them. Like I said, my father was gone, but he never told me. You know, my father never told me that he was in rehab. Like I just... I just figured that out on my own. I used to go visit him and then realize, oh, he was in rehab. Like, I knew he had problems with drugs and alcohol, but I didn't really, really realize that till I got older. And he would talk to me about it a little bit, but nobody was talking about therapy back then. The only time I saw therapy was on Frasier. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Or, or Tony Childs was, I think she might have been in therapy on Girlfriends, like, Suti Jill Marie Jones, that's my homie. But it's like, I didn't, I didn't, nobody knew about therapy. Like, nobody was talking about therapy. That's why I talk about it so openly. You know what I'm saying? Like, I talk about it so openly because I'm trying to make up for all the years uh, in black America that it wasn't being talked about. Because I know for a fact that if you get your mind right, everything else will fall into place. I truly believe that. I truly believe that your brain is that powerful. When we talk about the law of attraction, when we talk about The Secret by Ron DeBurn, like, your thoughts truly can become things. So if your brain is filled with anxiousness and insecurity and low self-esteem, like, what do you think you're gonna be attracting in your life? Mm -hmm. So I want all of us to be able to go, know that it's normal to have these feelings, but it's even more normal to flush them out. It's even more normal to talk them through with somebody. It's even more normal for a therapist to rep re recommend you some practices that can help you strengthen your mind, you know? So I'm, a, I'm, I'm gonna be champion in therapy till the day I die. Do you have people being like, oh, you changed? Cause you, like guys from the old, guys and gals from the old neighborhood or where you grew up, are they like, oh, you changed, you're different now? Cause you talk a little bit about people feeling like uh, stuck in where they came from instead of being like liberated by that or instead of feeling empowered by that. Do you feel, do you, tell me why you think it's a bad idea for people to like go back to the hood or like go back and, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not a bad idea. Like you gotta go back to make a way. You know what I'm saying? You go back to give back, you know what right. I'm saying? But I'm not about to go back and like sit under the tree with y'all and kick it and you know, drink liquor and smoke weed. Like I'm not about to do all of that. You know what I'm saying? Just because that's not my lifestyle anymore. Plus that's just a waste of time. That's just, mm -hmm. that's just as much a waste of time to me as being on social media, you know? But yeah, people do say I've changed, because I have, mm -hmm. and they should too. Matter of fact, the problem isn't that I changed, the problem is you didn't change. You didn't evolve, you didn't grow. You are still there stuck on stupid. Like I saw somebody on social media, you know, somebody from my hometown, like I thought she was my homegirl, but I guess she don't like me. She posted, she posted that, uh, <laughs> she said, he's coming out with another book of lies. And then somebody said, left a comment to her, and she said, uh, he's fake and a wannabe. And I'm like, a wannabe what? A wa like, like, a, like, a wannabe what? I'm 40 years old. I'm a nationally syndicated radio personality. New York Times bestselling author. I produce TV shows. I'm getting into the film world. I have my own businesses. I have a podcast network. What do I want to be? Yeah, yeah. Like, like, like I want to know, like, what do you, we, you, like, what do you, you're in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, my hometown that I love dearly. Want to be what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I want to know what do I want to be that I'm already not. Yeah. Like, I'm not out here pretending to be no gangster, no thug, because why would I want to be that? I'm not pretending to be no street nigga, like, why would I want to be that? I did that already. Been there, done that. Got me nowhere except for jail mm -hmm. and almost dead and almost broke sitting under the tree until I changed my ways and changed my habits and put myself in a different position to be where I'm at right now in order for you to be talking about me on Facebook because I'm putting out another, because I put out another national bestseller. How do you protect your mind then when, when you see stuff, hear stuff like that? How do you, because I'm sure your gut is like, you know what, fuck you. And then you're like, wait, hold on. 
I gotta that's fine. put something on there. You're right. That's fine. I yeah. immediately I do say that. I'm like fuck you, or, or or fuck you will come in my mind, and then I'll be like, you know what? God bless you. Mm. God bless them. You know what I'm saying? That's how you protect your mind. You protect your mind by really understanding that comes with the territory. Malcolm X said it. Malcolm X said, a man who has no critics likely has no success. So I'm used to all the critique. I'm used to all the criticism, you know, but what I won't be doing is consuming it all. So I don't have Twitter on my phone. I don't care what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Like when I post Instagram captures, you know what I do now? When I post Instagram, Pictures or videos, and I, I log out. I post and I log out. So you can't just open and scroll. You have to like type your password. I gotta type thing. my password in, and then when I do get in, I gotta make a concerted effort. Like I mean, a concentrated effort to go look at my comments. I don't do that. Like I don't care. Like I really, I have no other way of saying how much I don't care what it is you got to say about me. Good, bad, or indifferent. I appreciate it all. You know what I'm saying? The reason I appreciate it all is because there's this thing called engagement. And the more you talk about me, whether you know it or not. It pops up to the top. So if you don't look at it, you only get the benefit. Because yeah. your stuff pops up top and you don't see any of it, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And, and by the way, that helps, with the, that helps with the budgets, too. When, when, when these companies are looking and they're like, well, he damn sure gets mentioned on social media a lot. He's, yeah, 1,200 comments. Oh, well, they all hate him. I, I don't give a shit. Yeah, give him a raise. Give him a, give him a raise. Like, yeah. You know what? We need those 1,200 people that hate him or, or those 20,000 that hate him to right. see this fucking ad. Yeah, that's and, right. We'll, they're we'll, going to watch this show because they're going to be like, look at this dumbass. Hey, man. I'll watch every episode of this. That, damn that, that is the Howard Stern effect. Yeah, that is They used true. to say that people, they used to say that the people who love Howard no, the people who hate Howard listen twice as much as the people who love him. I totally believe that. You see these political shows and, and at all the one star review everywhere through iTunes, all this stuff is like, you're a racist piece of shit. And then you're like, man, this guy's a top 20 show. Half or more of his audience, Sam Harris has the same problem. Yeah. Half of his million downloads per episode are people who are like, I can't wait to see what this idiot racist piece of crap says this time. We're listening to, we're, we're in the digital attention mm -hmm. age, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a digital attention economy, right? And being that it's a digital attention economy, you really don't lose if you're getting mentioned on social media. Like, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad because you got people who hate you who gonna go hard and you got people who love you that's gonna go hard. And all they're doing is just constantly keeping your name in the ecosystem. Yeah, as long as you don't optimize for that because then you make yourself miserable. That's when you become Tommy Lauren. You know what I'm saying? When you when you when your goal is to piss people the fuck off just so you get mentioned, that's when you become her. And that's whack. Yeah. Cuz that don't last. You know what I'm saying? Like it got to be organic. Like I don't I don't I don't strive to piss people off, not at all. I have an opinion about things. I say things. People agree or they don't they they disagree. They either like me for it or they hate me for it or they just have a conversation about it. It might be just something I said to spark a conversation. I'm cool with that too. Like we had Killer Mike on the show last week, him and DJ Envy going at it. Conversation started on social media about public school versus private school. And when I'm out and about, when I've been out and about all this week, people have been coming to me, have, talking to me about that conversation, public school versus private school. So those are good things. You know what I'm saying? Like we're gonna have Corey Book on tomorrow. People are gonna be coming to me, yo, how's Corey in person? Is, mm -hmm. is you think he can do it? Like, I'm, that, that's great, that's gonna spark conversation. So it's just like, as, as long as a genuine, organic conversation is happening, cool. But if you're really just one of these people who's saying shit for attention, to me, you're just like a shock jock. Mm -hmm. And there's no value in shock. Never has been. Why do you think that, like, when I listen to 70s and 80s, I guess maybe it's just 80s hip-hop, where it's like they're telling silly stories, they're talking about, like, look at my, look at this fun thing that happened. Or, like, my, the, I went to my friend's house and the food was really bad or something like that. It's, like, it's fun and it's freedom, self-expression, and now it's like drugs, guns, girls. It's different now somehow. I can't put my finger on it, but it's like a different narrative entirely. I get what somehow. you're saying, but hip hop is not just that. Like, you know, hip hop is that on the surface when it's radio, or, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? But yeah. you, you know, you got the biggest rappers in the world are people who have substance. Kendrick Lamar. That's true. J. Yeah. Cole. 
You know, even Drake. I mean, Drake Drake has substance in his music, you know what I mean? That's true. I don't know Chance why. Chance the think, Rapper. Maybe it's just what they're playing it's, it's what they're in playing when I was radio. in high school or something. I but know. it might be, but it, you, I mean, you're not, you're not entirely wrong. I'm just saying that it's a, it's a pie. And it's, yeah. It's a lot of different toppings on this pie, you know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. it's all one pie. It's all pizza. But it's a lot of different toppings on this pizza. It's the pizza with everything on it. Because you are going to have your guys who rap about the guns and the drug use and... You know, you all gonna rap about the guys who are misogynistic and you know they over sex, you know over sexualized women. You are gonna have all of that, but you still have the people who are socially conscious. My favorite rapper right now is a woman. My favorite rapper of all the rappers is a woman from North Carolina named Rhapsody. I don't think there's nobody doper than Rhapsody. I look forward to hearing her rap. I think she is the best rapper of this new generation, this this new era. And like, she's just socially conscious. Like, and, and not even socially conscious in like a, a deep, you know, most, I don't even wanna say most depth, but just like a deep political way. Just like regular smegular girl from the, from the rural area of North, rural area of North Carolina, just, that observe that's observant. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That knows what's going on in the White House. That knows what's going on in the world as far as social justice. Just like just smart. You know? And 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 like that's that's what I vibe to. But then I might want to throw on some 21 Savage too. You know what I'm saying? I might want to throw on some Kodak Black too. By the way, two guys who people would probably look at and say, yo, all they rap about is guns and drugs, but even them, they got a lot of socially redeeming value in their music. So it's just really all about where what where where you where you get your hip hop from, and what kind of hip hop I guess you're listening to at yeah. the moment. I guess I was just thinking about what was on the radio probably back when I listened to the radio, which mm-hmm. was probably like ten years plus. The 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 FM band like of course now everything's been streaming and I've been a nerd for a hell of a long time. Yeah. So yeah, when you let other people choose your music, I guess you get that shift instead of when you curate, which is actually kind of a good metaphor for what you should be doing with everything in your life. It's like, find what you like, not what other people are putting in front of you. We live in a world of cur- constant curation. So it's just like, yo, you can make your own playlist, you know what I'm saying? You can subscribe to whatever radio you want to listen to, Pandora Radio, iHeart, whatever it is. Like, you can, you can literally listen to just what you want to listen to all the time. And like, if you throw on one of these playlists, like say you say you want to listen to Kendrick Lamar, they might recommend Rhapsody, they might recommend Chance the Rapper, they might recommend, you know, uh, Schoolboy Q, any any Wale, any of these guys that are really on that same wavelength you're looking for, you know? You talk in the book about constructive versus non-constructive worry. Because I was going to say, do you still worry about anything? Do you see that as constructive? But you do a little bit of both, right? I definitely do a lot of both, I feel like. I definitely do a lot of both. Um, like, how do we make that shift if we tend to worry about tons of stuff? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because... When I think about constructive worry, when I think about constructive worry, I often wonder, is worrying constructive at all? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe because then it makes me get prepared for stuff. Like, if I didn't worry at all, would I have read your book? Would I have been like, eh, I'm good. I'll just show up. Yeah. I don't know. Like, worry makes you, does worry make you go to the gym? Does worry make you go to a therapist? Does worry make you eat right? Does worry make you treat your wife like the queen that she is, does worry make you be the best father? I think so. A little bit, yeah. I definitely think so, because I, you know, I won't cheat on my wife because I worry that I will ruin my family Mm -hmm. the way I feel like my father ruined our family. You know what I'm saying? Um, I I go to the gym because I worry about being fat and overweight and, I eat right because I worry about how my skin's going to look because I know that I get skin discoloration oh, yeah. from certain things and yeah. I get acne from certain things. Like, I wor- like that's, I think that's constructive worry. Like, cause, but it's worry, but it's also it makes you take action. Right. You know what I'm saying? I think as long as we're taking action to go along with that worry, I think we'll be fine. Like positive action, not, neg- not like I'm never leaving the house because I'm worried people are going to judge me. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? And by the way, I got people... I got friends who have crippling anxiety, like yeah, that where they got to take medication to even think about leaving the house because oh, their, their anxiety crippled them so much and they worry so much that they'll just be sitting in the crib, 
like not doing anything, just sitting there. Oh man, that's got to be terrible. I think about that because I thought, oh, everybody, when when before I actually had to worry about anything in the past year or so, when people said, oh, I have anxiety, I was like, oh, okay. And then you experience a couple weeks of like sleepless nights or like, you know, physical, not eating, whatever it is. You start to then go, oh, this is what like real anxiety feels like. And it's no joke. So I, f I have real compassion for people who got to take medication to even think about leaving the house. Like I don't have that. I can't imagine what that's like, but I can kind of think about what that must feel like. And I've, I have sympathy the utmost sympathy for that. Because th imagine the things that you and I worry about, like, oh, what are people going to say online? Eh, whatever. Like, forget about it. That's, like, all those people could think about. Or that's, like, they think about that times 100 and they can't turn it off. Absolutely. That's got to be the worst. I think making that shift, think about what kind of action you take. Is it positive action? Then maybe it's, maybe it's the good kind of worry. If it's negative action, if it's inhibiting you, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not constructive. Yeah, that's what I said. You just don't know what it, you don't know what's constructive to worry about until you... <laughs> Until you put a little worry into it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Until yeah. you actually think about how worried about this should I get. You know what I'm saying? On mm -hmm. a scale of one to I just got diagnosed with cancer. Like, you know what I mean? Like right. what what how how much should you worry? You know what I'm saying? So it just depends on what the situation is, I guess. You yeah. Know? Like I'm going I'm going I suffer from parental paranoia. I'm going to worry about my kids. Yeah, I think that's normal. Yeah, yes. I'm worried about worrying about my kids I don't even have yet. I'm worried about, I got three daughters. Yeah. I got a 10-year-old that's in school, three-year-old that's going to be starting school this year, a four-month-old that's going to be starting school in another four four years. Like, yeah, I got worry. Like, why wouldn't I have worry? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I got a house full of sick people right now. My wife is sick. My four-month-old is sick. My three-year-old is sick. Yes, I worry about them. Like, why wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. Like, that's this, like, I, and I don't even know if that's constructive worry because there's nothing I can do nothing about them being do, yeah. sick. Like, literally, there's nothing I can do other than y'all going to the doctor, right? Or, hey, you take your medicine, hey, let your mom sleep. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, there's, there's nothing I can do. So, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a tricky one. The parental thing is a tricky one because it's like, it's not constructive, but you probably can't turn it off. It's probably... Nah. Hardwired. And I'm not turning it off. I refuse yeah. to turn it off. You know what I'm saying? It actually increases, you know, as 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 they get older and as you get older. You're you're a successful dude, so do you ever get we've all heard of fear of failure, everybody I think has that, but do you ever have the fear of success? I, I first heard about this, I didn't think it could possibly be real. I think the only reason people have a fear of success is because the fear of success runs parallel with the fear of failure. Meaning that a lot of us are motivated to be successful because we don't want to be failures. But then when you get it, you don't want to lose it. So when you get it and you don't want to lose it, then you start, you know. Oh, that's interesting. Start, right. So it's not you start really feeling like you might fail. Right. So it's not really fear of of being successful. It's fear of being successful and then having it all go away. Yeah. I never thought about it like that. Yes. So that's I, definitely worse. Yeah. So for me, that's what it is. It's not like it's not necessarily the success uh, factor that makes me afraid. It's the fear of not being successful anymore. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Like that fear of not being successful anymore is what causes me to feel like, damn, I don't want to. I don't want to fail, so to speak. So it's not like I'm sitting around just constantly thinking about, oh, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. Because you got you can't be afraid to fail, right? Like. Every time I got fired, I failed up, allegedly. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like I, you can't be afraid to fail. Like, you can't be afraid to make mistakes. You can't be afraid to do some things that were wrong. You can't be afraid to fuck up. Like, that's just the way life is, right? So I can't walk around with a, a sense of uh, fearing to fail. But I can have a sense of being successful and not wanting that to go away. Which is, also, which is like a camouflage version of fearing to fail. So you're like, oh, I don't fear failure, but then we do all this other stuff and it's like, what's going on? It's camouflage fear of failure in your fear of success. That's, yeah. I had never thought about that. That's a really good point. And I feel like that's a sneaky ass way to sit around and worry. It's like locking the front door, but the back door is like wide open. <laughs> and you're like sitting there with the front door, you got like your rifle out. You're like, nobody's getting, no worries getting through here. Absolutely. Meanwhile, the back door is wide open. You got raccoons coming in the back. Exactly. Here. That's, that's, yeah. that's exactly what it is.
Huh. Charlamagne, thank you, man. Always thought-provoking conversation. My brother, Jordan, thank you, man.